What is up, Sandals Church youth? My name is Blake. I am one of your youth leads over at the Hunter Park campus. Maybe you have never been here before. Maybe it's your first time. Well, I want to let you know that Sandals Church youth is all about this vision of being real. And it starts with groups. It's the bread and butter, the meat and potatoes of what we do here on a Wednesday night. And maybe you're online, maybe this is your first time here. We're gonna have a number for you to text at the bottom of the screen so you can get connected either at a campus in person or online. We're starting a brand new series called Promises. And this series is all about God's faithfulness as it relates to his promises laid out for us in the Bible. And so this week we have Justin Knowles to start off and to kick off this series talking all about what waiting on the Lord looks like. So let's hear what God has for us in this series. I'll see you guys after. Sure. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. So I'm going to leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> Wasn't that cute? The adult made promises they would get more marshmallows and they just, their little hearts couldn't take it. Uh, man, and keeping like waiting for a promise sometimes could be so hard to do. No matter who gives it, no matter how much you trust them, waiting for that is just, it's so hard sometimes. Like many of us in our society, 
Waiting does not come naturally for us, especially today in today's world. We are in an instant microwave culture. We need results and we need it right now. We wanna lose 10 pounds in 10 days. We gotta gobble down our food on the, on the way. Like as you're driving, stuffing your face full of a burrito just because you're so in a hurry and that you need to happen. We got medicines that promise to take away pain immediately. You know what frustrates me that I hate waiting for? Slow walkers. Have you ever been in front of someone or behind someone who is a slow walker? I wanna punch them in the back of the head. I'm sorry, but that's just true. It is. Slow internet, another thing. If you wanna test your patience, slow internet because I need to know all the things right now and I don't wanna wait a second. See, oftentimes when we comes to our prayers, when it comes to the promises of God, we, we want certain things on our schedule and our timing and it boils down to the fact that we just do not like to wait for anything or for any one. See, we wanna see results right now. We can't wait. We want to see it in this moment. And usually we want it, those things on our terms. And if you're anything like me, waiting on God's promises, looking at scripture, wait, like just waiting for the things that God says he's going to do when we read his word, waiting for those things is so hard sometimes. And first of all, I gotta ask you, do, do, you, do you even know what God's promises are? Ooh, that's, that's already a hard question because you can't know what God promises you unless you're in his word. And so what, you know, when things seem silent, especially on God's end, there seems to be no answer coming. And we just are in this waiting game. When all seems to be lost and we're beginning to become impatient, there's, there's like nowhere to go. And we begin to wonder in our brains, it's like, okay, is God even real? Does he even like listen to me? Does he even care about what is happening in this situation right now that I am in? And we begin to think like, man, why am I even putting effort into this? Why am I even coming on Wednesday nights? Why am I going into a small group? Why am I coming on the weekends? Why am I giving? Why am I serving? Why am I not doing certain things that I know that I'm not supposed to be doing? But like, why wouldn't I just do them anymore? And we begin to wonder while we're waiting. And it's just, it's just all of that is just to say, it's like whoever, like who, for whoever has considered giving up on waiting on God to move, whoever has considered about throwing in the towel, moving on, wondering if there actually is a God out there who even cares about what's going on in your life. I have some great news for you and that you're not alone and that the first ever Christmas is for you. It's for us. See, when it comes to patiently waiting, I think that there is a few things that we could learn from the story of Luke 1, where it's the beginning of the Christmas story, using the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth that could help challenge us during the time of waiting. When we seem to be praying, or maybe we're, I get that some of you are not even, are not believers yet, and maybe you're just wondering if there's even a God out there waiting for you, like listening to you that you're waiting on, hoping, grasping onto the fact that maybe he's real. That I think that this story of, of during this Advent season, during this time of our year could really challenge us and help us grow. And I got four things for you that I wanna share with you that what happens when we, that has to do with waiting and waiting patiently on the promises that God gives us. So number one, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down, is that waiting needs to be accompanied by faithfulness. Waiting needs to be accompanied by faithfulness. So before we even talk about Zechariah, before we talk about uh, Elizabeth, is that we have to understand the implications of the story within Luke 1 as it fits into the entire story of God. That in this passage that we're reading about in Luke 1 is that we're, we find the beginnings of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, and he's the one that comes before Jesus saying, hey, everybody, he is coming. The Lord is coming. And Israel, the people of God, have literally been in a waiting game this entire time. That in order to understand the full context of this story is that we have to understand that in our Bible from the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament, and when we hit Luke 1, there is 400 years of silence of God. 
Meaning that the last time that God spoke to his people was 400 years ago, and then all of a sudden, Luke 1 happens, and he speaks up. And they've been waiting all this time for a promise that God gave them 400 years ago, 2,000 years ago when it comes with Jesus. So let's pick up in Luke 1, starting in verse 5, and it says this. It says, In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron, and both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and degrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once then, Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by lot, meaning just by kind of random, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So basically in the temple, there's this place called the Holy of the Holies, and that's where they go, and it's like a, 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 a really prestigious honor to go in there and it's only one person at a time and then what they would do is they would tie a rope around you because only a certain person could go in there just in case someone died they could pull you out because that's how much they took care of this right so this is Zachariah he got to go into this area of the church and the temple and it was a really big deal to burn incense and then the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. So the angel appearing to him in this moment is a very, very significant moment. This moment breaks 400 years of silence of God and his people. Like have you ever have you ever impatiently waited for something like for me, it's my wife when we go to bed. Right? When I say I want to go to, like, it's time to go to bed, I'm literally within three minutes, I am brush my teeth uh, in my pajamas and I am laying in bed ready to fall asleep as soon as my head hits the pillow. But my wife's version of, hey, let's go to bed means, hey, let's do the dishes real quick and then let's vacuum, let's fluff all the pillows and I'm going to knit a sweater. And then by like, you know, 25 minutes later, she comes waltzing and I'm like, out, like just drooling and she's mad at me because she wanted to talk, right? Like that's, that's what I'm, that's what it means to like patiently wait for someone. Or like, have you ever tried to follow or to, you're in a hurry and you have a little brother or sister have a toddler try to put on their own shoes? Oh my, oh God, they're slip-ons. Okay, anyways, that's just my kid, right? Like it's just, I'm patiently, impatiently waiting for them. And this is what it's felt like in this moment, that there's literally 400 years of silence waiting on God to move, and then all of a sudden, boom, there's an angel in front of Zechariah waiting to speak. So while they're waiting, they look, look at, look at what is described about Zechariah and Elizabeth. In verse six, if you go back, it says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So here's the thing. While they were in the waiting game, while they were waiting for God to move, they haven't heard from him, his people, haven't heard from him in hundreds of years, yet these two were still being very obedient to what God had called them to do. Even though they were waiting for him, even though they haven't heard his voice, they, were, they did all the things that they were supposed to do. They were both both righteous in the sight of God. Why? Because they lived out and they were obedient to what God has called them to do. While they were waiting on God's promise, they were still being obedient. See, mind you, they were keeping laws based off promises given hundreds of years ago. They were waiting on promises of, okay, God, that, I, that you are gonna come to life and come back to us. And they were still obeying even though they've not heard a thing. And so, Here's the thing, not only did God break 400 years of silence, not only would he come through on a promise that he made over 2,000 years ago, not only did he say that he would give them a child who would announce the kingdom of God and pointing the way to Jesus. See, here's the thing, he did all of those things. And when it comes to waiting on the promises, waiting on God to move in our lives, it comes down to two things. It comes down to two key elements. It's a complete dependence on God, and a willingness to allow him to decide the terms, to decide the timing, because what we want is our timing, but we have to wait on what his timing is. See, God's gift to us is eternity, where our gift back to him is our faithfulness and our obedience. 
Second thing I want you to write down when it comes to waiting on the promises of God is that waiting reminds us that God is in control. Waiting forces us and reminds our, us that God is the one who is in control. Continuing on in verse 12 in Luke 1, it says, When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you are to call him John, and he will be a joy and a delight for you. And many of you will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he will never take wine or other ferment to drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. And he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of his parents and to the children of the disobedient and the wisdom of the righteous to make ready for the uh, people prepared for the Lord. So basically what he's saying, John is going to bring people back who, who after the 400 years that they maybe wandered off. They forgot about God's promises and that he's saying that John is going to be the one to point them back to Jesus. In verse 18, that Zechariah then asked the angels, how can you be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife as well along in years. See, let me stop there for a second because I love this. This is a, such a great question. This is the question that I would be asking in the middle of this. While I was in the middle of a waiting season, I would be asking this of like, you know, like how can I know? How do I know that this is going to come true? God, you've said this. I've read this. People have told me this. How do I know that this is going to come? How do I know that this is even real? It's a great question. And maybe you're asking that question. Maybe that's what you're thinking about in the season. God, how do I know that any of this is going to come to fruition? How do I know that you're going to come through on your promises? See, I love that. It's a great, great question that he asks. In verse 19, it says, The angel said to him, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day that this happens because you did not believe my words in which true, that will come true at their appointed time. See, notice the last half of that sentence is that which will come true in their appointed time. Meaning, it's not about your time. It's about when God says it's going to happen. It's on his time and his agenda and his pace. So usually our pace is not God's pace, which is why we get impatient. And what happens is that we begin to start to wander off and do our own thing and forget and leave the promises of God that he has over here. And so all this what to say is like, man, do you mean that God marked this day years from like years ago when things looked bleak, when things looked like they were out of control, when things looked like they weren't gonna come true? Do you mean that God still had a plan and he knew exactly what was gonna happen in the day and the time and the second where it looked all bad all these years and he was silent for 400 years? Are you saying that God had this day planned in advance because it's his plan and his timing and his agenda? Yes, and that's the thing about who he is and what we are confident in is that when we, when, he is, when we wait on him, he is in control. It forces us and reminds us that he is the one who's got all this thing, all these things figured out. And the promises that we're waiting on are so much better when we do wait and we are patient. See, we have a certain idea about how things should go. We have a, our own agenda in our mind. We want it our way, and something, sometimes we think that our way is the best way. We just want the control. Some of you are control freaks because you want to know the next step. You want to know the next 10 steps. You want to know everything that needs to happen in order to make this happen. But here's the thing is that when we realize and we trust and we wait on the one who holds everything is that we could know and rest in the fact that there is, that he has everything under his control. And that God is working on something that we don't even fully understand. But it'll be far better than we ever thought when we wait patiently for him to move. Third thing, I want you to write this down, is that when God promises, he delivers, always. When God promises, he delivers always. Me? Mm -mm, not so much. I suck at keeping promises. You know how I know? Um, I have kids, 
and I promise them a lot of things, and a lot of that stuff is just so that they stop asking me questions, right? Like, it's like, yes, well, I'll have this. Yes, you can have a snack. Yes, we can watch that movie. I'll never forget, though, this one time that I was about to leave. I was going to go speak at a summer camp, and I was, like, rushing to get out the door. And Graham, he was, like, obsessed with going to the zoo. Dad, can we go to the zoo? Dad, can we go to the zoo? Dad, can we go to the zoo? And I'm like, yes, buddy, we could go to the zoo. And I'm, like, kind of packing up everything. And he goes, Dad, can we go to the zoo when you come back? And I said, yes, buddy, we could go. He's like, do you promise? And I'm, like, getting everything ready. And, he, and I go, yes, buddy, I promise. And I'm out the door, and I go. So four days later, I come back. The moment I walk in the door, Graham looks at me. He says, Daddy, can we go to the zoo? And I'm like, what are you talking about? No, we're not going to go to the zoo. And he literally loses his little mind and runs into his room screaming. And I kid you not, it's like a movie. You promised, you promised. You promised, you promised, you promised, you promised, you promised. And I'm like literally like heartbroken, thinking I am the worst dad. That like I don't keep all of my promises, but here's the thing, God does. When he promises something, he delivers always. Luke, 20, Luke 1, verse 21, look what it says. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering that he, why he stayed so long in the temple. So remember, he had this encounter with this, this angel, and people were starting to wonder what's happened to him. And when he came out, he could not speak to them, and then he realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. And when, the, uh, when his time of service was completed, he returned home, and after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant for five, and for five months she remained in seclusion. And the Lord has done this for me, she said. In the days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among my people. There's a lot in that passage. So basically what it comes down to is that when God speaks and he promises that they would have a baby after they, for them, now they're in old, they're old people now they're having a baby because God told them that they were. God delivered on that promise. He delivered. That God was gearing up to do what he had planned to do all along because he is a keeper of promises. That is who, that is who he is. Yes, we might have to wait. Yes, it may not be on our time. Yes, we might not like what happens in the midst of us waiting because we don't like to wait on anything. But when we wait, we realize that it's not about us. Oh, that's the hard part. Most of the time that when we think about like what, like it's because we think it's all about what we want to do. No. When we wait, it forces us to think, hey, it's not about us, but it's all about him. And the first Christmas story, this story, this is our story. We've all been where Zachariah and Elizabeth have been asking. It's like, man, do I stay or do I go? Do I believe in God or do I not? Do I believe God is going to come through in this area of my life or is he not? Am I going to continue to serve or am I just gonna do something else? Do we sacrifice and begin to live the way that I want to live now or do I live in the way that I know that God is calling us to live? Do I stay engaged or do I... Do I just do whatever I want to do? Maybe you feel that. Maybe that's the tension that you're feeling right now in your face. See, here's the thing, is that when the temptation to quit is at its strongest, it's right about the time that God's about to move the greatest. When the temptation to quit and to do your own thing is at its strongest, it's usually right about the time that God is going to step up and keep his promises and move in our lives more so than we've ever thought before. See, waiting for a promise is not all that bad when you realize who made the promise. Waiting for the promise, if you know you could trust them, that that promise is gonna come true. Waiting for that promise is way easier when you know and trust who made the promise. In Isaiah 30, 18, it says, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is, good, is the God of justice. Blessed are those who wait on him. What he's saying is that you are blessed when you wait because he is a deliverer of promises always. Because ultimately, last thing, number four, waiting builds intimacy with God. Waiting builds intimacy with God. See, I've noticed that God tends to move the most in the in-between times. It's not from A 
and then B, God moves. Like God moves here and then God moves here. It's usually on the journey from A to B that God tends to move the most. See, back in the days when I was uh, dating Kristen and COVID was not a thing where we were actually able to go to Disneyland, right? We would go to Disneyland. It was a great date night because we both had passes and we were able to go a couple nights a week. And the, the best part about Disneyland with her, it wasn't the rides, although the rides are awesome. It wasn't the food, although the turkey legs and churros are awesome, right? Like, those, oh, I just missed that. I can't wait till we go back. It wasn't the, the souvenirs. It wasn't the, like the atmosphere. Do you know what the best part about waiting, uh, about being at Disneyland with my future wife was? It was the waiting in line. It was waiting in line for the rides. You know why? because it was forced conversation. It was forced intimacy. It was usually in the waiting times where we got to talk and we got to know each other better. That it was in the waiting time where it was just us two forced to be together, just to talk and get to know each other and ask each other questions. And what happens is that our intimacy grew and our relationship grew and we got to know each other better. And I look back at those times and I'm like, I'm so thankful for those times because it was in the waiting that grew our intimacy. And our relationship strengthened because of that. And same with our faith. Waiting causes, forces intimacy with God. So instead of running away and wanting to do your own thing because you're tired of waiting on God to come through, I challenge you, what would it look like for you just to sit and wait and be patient for God to move and to come through on the promises that he gives us, that we read and encounter in scripture? So the reason we get to read the stories of these great men and women in scripture is because they went through difficulties of life with God. That in the end, they got to experience God in ways because they went through the process of waiting and waiting on the promises of God that we may not fully understand why we have to wait, but the good news is that God never asks us to wait and do it alone. That he is literally with us every step of the way. And sometimes when we become impatient, we become like the little kids in the video that you saw at the very beginning, where we just, all we want is that one marshmallow. And we just, if we could just not wait, because I just want that instant satisfaction right then and there. But in reality, when God is saying like, hey, when you wait on me, when you're patient with me, because I'm a deliverer of my promises, you get so much more that life has to offer. And so, the thing that with this whole Christmas story and this whole Christmas season is that he is literally Emmanuel, meaning that he is literally God with us, that even that when we are waiting on him, it is still worth it. That even though that we are capable of doing our own thing, it is still worth it to wait on him because one move of God could change our life. One move of God could change someone in your life's life if we're just constantly waiting patiently for him. Why? Because his timing is always perfect. And when he moves, he tends to move in some big, big ways. And we can mess it up. We could jumpstart it. We could miss out on the full blessing that God has for us if we decide to do our own thing and not wait anymore. And my hope and my prayer for you is that, that I, want, I want you to experience all that God has to offer. I want you to experience the blessing that God has when we are patiently waiting on him that he is a deliverer of promises, and, that, and that's a promise from him. And the question that I wanna end with before we go into groups is this. Do you believe it? Do you actually believe that God is who he says he is and that he will promise, and when he promises something that we read in scripture, that that thing will come true in our life as well? Don't be the little kid that, that jumped ahead and, and had one marshmallow when he could have gotten two. Because when we sit and are, we're patient, God says that he will move in our life far greater than we could ever understand. You guys, we love you and we'll have a great time in groups. Wow, Justin, waiting builds intimacy. Some of your strongest relationships are built through the in-between time of your life. 
But guess what? Your relationship with God is also increased while waiting for His promises. But something that you don't have to wait for, you don't have to wait for groups because groups are coming up. And when groups are over, and as we continue through this holiday season, we want you guys to continue to build that community with the people in your life that you can be real with. And maybe you're not involved in a community right now. Maybe you're not involved in a group. Again, we have that text at the bottom of the screen where you can get plugged in. Man, I can't wait to see and to hear what you guys are doing through the holiday season. And I cannot wait for next week as we continue in our series, Promises. I'll see you then.